All right. We are going to go to integrals, the second half of calculus. I hope that the thing on, on derivatives gave you a better idea what a derivative is, especially doing it numerically. And I know I've talked to people about this in the past that, you know, the, um, when you can understand things numerically, do them discreetly, you, your, your depth of understanding increases greatly. The derivative, for instance, is something that I believe every human should understand, could understand. Now, they don't want to, they don't want to listen to all this, you know, math jargon that goes with it. I'll agree with you there, but everyone can understand that. The same thing with an integral, and it's all based on this same thing of a finite difference. Let's say you have a function in time. Let's say you have a function in time. Like this. And let's say that is the rate of change. Okay, you're, so you're given the rate of change and, and it's like a finite difference and you want to find what the function was. So with derivatives, with derivatives, you were given the function and this was the question mark. Now, the opposite. You're given the rate of change and you have to determine the function from it. So going up the interstate, for instance, you know, I talked about velocity. You know, you can measure your distance between mile markers. Now, let's say your odometer was broken. You don't have a way to measure how far you've gone, but your speedometer works. See, now you can take your rate of change over various times. Okay, and really it all comes down still using this notion of a finite difference. One thing you can do is, is you wanna know, so you say, you know that G of T. So you say, well, I'll go from a starting, and, and let's say you're given the starting point, you go from a known starting point, um, you know, you go from a known starting point up to some unknown point. Well, you do the algebra on this, and that gives you an estimate of where you're going using a finite difference using a, you know, a, a numerical derivative. Now, it might be that things change so much over the course of your trip that one average is not good enough. What you might need to do is measure, you know, is take your G, at, you know, your rate of change at, you know, several times and add them together, thereby coming up with this sum the so-called Ryman sum. And where's the little picture that goes with it? These journal, these people, this book won't put my pictures where I wanted them. But nevertheless, you're now you're saying, you're just G of, G of, of T is given to you, you see, the solid black line. So what you do is you evaluate it at say a point over an interval. And so you take G at time one times the interval time one, time one to time zero, and number two, and number three, dot, 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 up to end. And now, rather than one big crude finite difference across the whole thing, in this particular case, you work yourself in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or seven little steps. You can see, though, that even this looks stair-steppy. So the way you can do it, instead of seven steps, go in 10,000 steps, go into 10,000 tiny, tiny little steps and thereby giving yourself something that looks more like this, which in fact is the integral. The area under this curve is the integral. So as you see, you can do this from, um, the, the, the classic is predict, predict displacement knowing velocity. Well, say you don't have this, but you got velocity data at discrete times, you add them up. That is like this little picture shows, the the Ryman sum, I guess we will call that sometime, but it has this interpretation here. And that leads us to then a summary of calculus, which I want to go to next, and then I'll go back to some of the other things. Eh, my little favorite picture was done upside down and sideways, so I have to go to one. Um, I have to go to you know, I have to escape that and go view, uh, rotate, 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 like this. Okay. 
Well. I know you've been through three or four courses in calculus. Why cover calculus, et cetera? And, and the reason being, I think that many students don't do it at the level I want. And I, of course, some of you might have made a D or C or something not so good, but there's a lot of students I've talked to and, and, and their understanding is not where I want it to be. And I said, well, how'd you do in your calculus? Well, I'm in A minus or an A. So there's a lot of students who are, because they're good students and they work hard and they you know, did what they were supposed to do, made an A, but it's not a good enough A. So here we go. We've got derivatives and integrals. These are the two branches of calculus, right? the two things. Now, here is the concept kind of stuff. The concept of a derivative is if I give you some data or a function f, you are supposed to estimate for me the time rate of change or the derivative with x or the derivative with t. Most of the time in engineering, we're taking derivatives with time or derivatives with x. Well, most of the time we'll probably take derivatives with time in this course. Okay, so that's the idea. You find this. On the other hand, On the other hand, I want all that encapsulated. Now, the opposite is I'll give you the G, you find for me the F. You see the, the exchange of the I know it and I don't know it, question mark in the check. And sometimes this is called the antiderivative, which sounds like sort of a negative thing. I don't know why I always like that name, but actually it makes sense, the derivative or it's antiderivative, you know. Now, I think what's I think what's the problem with calculus is this here. And this is strict and it's mathematic and it's a crazy limit. Uh, you know, we say uh, you, day one calculus in high school, whatever. Hello, my name is Mrs. Polson or whatever yours was named. And da da da. And a derivative is the limit of all. It's like what? And I think that if we went to this line first and truly understood a numerical approximation first, then to tell somebody, look, do a little bit more accurate, little, take measurements over a little smaller time steps, more, more accurate, then it would make sense what we're doing here. And so here's what we're doing. The derivative is approximated as a finite difference. This one happens to be a forward difference, but you could have used a backwards or centered kind of thing. Um, because you're going to take the limit is very small steps. You does I don't know that matters too much. Well, okay. Anyway, we've been we've been doing a week of this, and I, hopefully that makes sense to you. But now we see we rearrange this information in these little steps, and now we get the Riemann sum over here, which is a summation of these little steps. And so, I think this box here is the key to understanding calculus and really understanding it not just at a level to make an A in a calculus course, at a higher level than that. Then you can understand that this thing we call, see, we take the, the approximation, this thing we call the derivative, this D, F, D, T, a strange notation, is this same discrete concept that's very understandable for anybody measuring distance and time, but just do it under small, just do it on the tiniest little time step you can to make it accurate. And fortunately down here, thank goodness, the geometric interpretation, if you're a visual learner like myself, the, the concept of a derivative then in fact is the slope of the curve at that point, where the finite difference is the slope of some other secret might have been. Thank goodness. And then, you know, over here on the integral parts, well, you rearrange this, you get the little fi your finite sum. Now you get this very strange concept of taking the limit of delta t goes to zero. Like what? Like you gave me, I understood it when you gave me 10 velocity measurements and 10 time, I'd added the numbers up, but now what? I don't have those. I know, but theoretically, you're supposed to get not just 10 measurements or 100 measurements. You're supposed to be able to take an infinite number of them over tiny, tiny little, little steps. and do this and now here 
this, I think the box, the abstraction in this box is what, why calculus is not understood at the level I would like it to be understood. You've got to go to the previous box. You, this strange snake, this S looking like a, it's like a sum. And I think it was chosen because this looks like a sum like thing. And, but what it means is this limit, like what the hell? I don't have a watch that goes down to zero time can measure a femtosecond or a, whatever it is. And I don't have, I can't possibly make the measurements every nano or femtosecond. So this is an abstraction. Start here completely before you go here. We in this course are gonna do this box. We're not gonna do this. This is what you do in normal calculus. And thank goodness, oh, praise the whatever. Thank goodness that this thing has a geometric interpretation of the area under the curve because the little boxes now, as you take an infinite number of them, now they, the seven boxes I showed you in the diagram, they look jerky. They look, you can clearly see the inaccuracy. But when you have a trillion of them, the inaccuracy for all intents and purposes is gone. And when you have an infinite number of them, the, if somehow you could do that, the, the error is completely gone and you get a perfect answer. Nice, nice, nice. So with that, then, oh, we gotta go back to, gotta go back to matter, rotate um, the other way. Okay, so therefore, where's my little picture? Okay, going back to this picture. So this is whatever that one count, seven, seven little rectangles. And you can see seven. Would you agree with me if I had 7,000 rectangles, the jerkiness would look be almost imperceptible and the answer would be very good. That is, it is the integral under this, the integral of this curve is the summation of these rectangles approximately. In this particular case, the numerical approximation using the seven rectangles would be what? Too high, wouldn't it? You can clearly see it's got too much. It's got a little too much in a lot of places. You could take the center point do center differences, you could take the backward point. But as you take finer and finer measurements, it goes like that, you see. And with that, picture in mind, things like the mean value theorem, you don't need to memorize this anymore. This should become quite obvious from this picture here. If you want the integral of this function between A and B, doesn't it make sense if you get an appropriate average and take the area of that rectangle. Area of a rectangle is very easy, right? It's the base times the height. So it would be B minus A times this. The area under this curve here, gosh knows what, it's all up and down, hooky and thing. But an appropriate mean value can give a rectangle that's exactly the, 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 the interval. So now the mean value theorem, I think hopefully it should make complete sense, not something you memorize. Integration by parts. Integration by parts, same thing. We've got some elaborate formula, but think of, think of discrete steps. Think of the change of a product of two functions, like this, the product rule. Rearrange it and integrate both sides. And now, the integration by parts formula should make sense. If I asked you to pop off, off the top of your head, the integration by parts formula here, and you go, uh, well, I don't blame you. It's, it's a, bunch of, it, a whole bunch of symbols like this, if you don't visualize them or know where they came from, it's very hard to memorize. It's like memorizing random symbols. But if you know where they came from, and if and they all come from this one idea of a finite difference and adding finite, they all come from that. They all come from one basic little picture with pulses, okay? Then you can take a piece of paper and in a, in a minute or two or whatever, redrive this formula for yourself. Okay, you can redrive it for yourself. Understand it with the, with the realization about the little discrete differences and finite differences and things, and you'll be not only derive it, but you'll be confident that you've got 
a correct derivation where you have the integration by parts. And you have, in general, you can um, extend that to the divergence theorem in the multidimensional problem. It's used a lot in the So, just one more example why knowing concepts is so much important than memorizing a formula. Not that, not, not, I'm not saying that integration by parts is the most important thing about calculus. It's, it's one of the things that can be very useful at times, but it's not the main thing. But my point here is all this stuff, mean value, integration by parts, the next thing is Leibniz rule, even worse, is if you understand a basic, basic concept that any human can understand, you can derive it yourself. And you know, this thing about patterns, like there was an experiment, they did a, did a test that I thought was very interesting. Anybody play chess? You know, it's that game with the pieces you move around. But they did this experiment and they took a, a grandmaster, a chess grandmaster, and they part way into a game, enough somewhere there was a good bit of interaction of the pieces, but still say two thirds of the pieces were left and, and whatever, so whatever complicated looking chess board, okay. And they gave the Grand Master something like two minutes to look and re look and memorize the board. Then they took the board away and gave him a bunch of chess pieces and asked him to create the board again. And he's able to do it perfectly. He's one of the best chess players in the world. They repeated the experiment with the same number of pieces still in play, but they put the pieces randomly on the board and the chess master could no longer repeat what he just looked at because it had no patterns to him. When he looked at the original chess game, it matched patterns that were ingrained in his mind. It matched, it matched intelligence, but just randomly. So if equations like this look like randomness to you, of course you don't remember what they are. Of course you don't understand them. If you see patterns in them, if you see logic, then they make complete sense. If this little picture makes sense, adding up Tons of them make sense, and this little graph makes sense. So, there's this obscene word, okay, and I'm not supposed to use language like this in a, in a classroom, okay, so you can report me if I say this, but there's this term, and I want to say it once because it is really vulgar is plug and chug. You'll never hear me say it again. Okay. Sorry about the obscenity here. Okay, another another example of this, and we probably won't use this too much, so I'm not going to pour over it, but the Leibniz rule, upon occasion in calculus, and we won't in this course, you'll need to know this fancy interval. If you have a function of x in time and you integrate in one of the variables, say x, and you integrate and stuff changes with time. Not only the integrand, but the limits of integration change with time. This comes up in fluid mechanics, this comes up in places, and it's in my notes if you happen to need it. But you know, it's, I, I derived it by insight and I came up with this fancy formula here. This is another example of a fancy formula that if I, if I gave you five minutes to memorize it, few people could do it. And if I gave you an appropriate amount of time and some logic behind it, you could derive it. And it's a beautiful thing to derive. And this particular one is sort of dear to my heart because I can remember um, way back, I was in, I think I was in graduate school, I was in graduate school and you know, I'd gone home to see my parents over Thanksgiving or something like that and I had some homework and I didn't have my book and I need Leibniz rule. I was like, oh God, it's And I sat there with a piece of paper and struggle with it and derived it myself. And I went, oh my goodness, you know, I, I just again from these basic ideas of little little pieces, you know. And um, that was kind of a watershed moment. It's like, oh, the fact it's long doesn't matter. You know, if you give me a short formula and it's just randomness to me, I can't tell you. But this one I could repeat to you because it makes sense, not because I'm so good at memorizing things. Anyway, that's calculus. You've seen all this calculus before. One of my favorites, as you know, is the beloved step function. There it is, the step function. 
um, another, and and all of its children and grandchildren. The, the step function is the granddaddy, right? And um, the pulse is is one of its one of its children. So there's the step function. From it, you can make the pulse. Notice this thing is used a lot, I think, or so could be used a lot, it is used a lot. How do you make a, how do you make this pulse? Does everybody agree with this picture here? That that thing is equal to one that starts here the whole way, minus one over here. It's equal to that one, minus that one. This is a key idea in building hard things from easy th easier earth things, you know. So here we, we start with something, we'll, we'll call this easy, the pulse, I mean the uh, step. And from the step, we want to build a pulse. So what we do is we turn a step on and turn a step off and we end up with here, which means a, a pulse function can be obtained as the difference in two steps. Right? Where's the full formula up here? There it is up here. This is kind of crazy, guys. We can put the pictures right. I want the picture right where the formula is, but it wouldn't do it for me. Okay, so, but there, so see this idea here? That's why I'm able to take two step functions and factor. Here is the logic. I mean, it's it's a logical statement, you know, like that. That's the way you'd say it in English. I mean, that's what the step function is. The way you'd say it, the step function in English is if the argument's negative, it's zero, else it's a one. And it's called the step function. So it's a logical function, really. For notes, you can build lots of things. You can integrate it, of course, you get a ramp. You can um, look at various things like that, including the delta functions, one of my all time favorites. Now, what I want to do here is you have a homework problem. I just released it earlier. Not, not too long ago, at least the problem itself, and we'll come up with a quiz. We haven't posted a quiz concerning it yet. But here, for instance, let's, let's get that ribbon thing out of the way. Don't look too nice. Let's see. I don't want you to see that. Let's view uh, without the uh, thing here. Okay, okay let, let's take a real rudimentary problem here. Problem four or five from the book, and this one well, should help you do the first problem in the homework. The function at hand is the following. It's just, as you see it, it's six for a while, but it's nothing. Okay. okay. What is the integral of that function between zero and three? And notice the use of the dummy variables. Some people put as T prime. Prime often means derivative, so I don't use that. I pretty much use the little sub zero, that's not a, that's not a, it's an O, a sub O, rather sub zero, as my dummy variable of integration. But note, I see even esteemed professors write this, like this. And I grit my teeth when I see that. That's just, just it's horrible, horrible, just horrible. And I want to get rid of that, I want to undo, I want to undo that. Hold on this. Yeah. Okay, see T is there, you can't use it. You can't have several meanings for the same symbol in the same equation. Okay. So it's called a dummy variable. And it has to be anything but the variables that are used. You can't choose that. You can't choose other parameters if they existed. But anyway, let's, let's talk about this first case. Via chat or piping in or speaking up, what do you think the answer is?
Let's see what do we got here. Where the heck's my chats? I don't know where they are. I don't know chats all the time. Chat. Four. Chat. Eighteen. We got an answer. Eighteen. Who votes for this correct answer? And how might we get that correct answer? Let me see. No, 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 no. Too far. I don't want to do that. There. Okay. Um, now, I want to evaluate. Now, note, when, when time is between zero and three, the function is always a six. So you can bring a six outside the integral. These panels in my way. Um, so see when a constant can come out and then you're integrating time to zero. So you get 18. Now, how about this one? So that turned out to be six times three, right? So this should be six times eight, right? 48. Who votes for the wrong answer, 48? I hope you're all not seeing this stupid little screen down here below. I mean, it's in my way, I can't get to things. Um, what do the chats say? We got anything uh, in there? Oh, where's the chat, where's the chat line? 24. Who agrees with the correct answer, 24? And here you see that the interval from zero to eight, the function changes, changes course. You see zero to eight, it's not one thing the whole way. It's something for a while and something else for a while. So with, and, and a, um, a suggestion, a lifetime suggestion in calculus, or in mass and everything. If, if you have something that's in two distinct parts, I suggest you evaluate it as two distinct parts. Do the, do the part one, part two. Don't try to do it all in one big fell swoop. You can put it into a final formula. So in other words, between zero and four, it's one thing between four and eight. So here you go. I'm, I'm breaking my integral between zero and four and between four and eight. In the zero to four, six comes outside. In the zero to eight, zero comes outside. Therefore, we come up with the correct answer, 24. Now, on with this one. What do y'all think about that one? Where's all my little chats? Do I have any, have anybody even brave enough on this one? How many, how many, how many vote for the incorrect answer that is still always 24? This right here, to me, this question right here, often separates the people that made an A in calc, that made an A in calculus, the not so good A, and those that really understood it and made a good A. As I said, time Notice that time is up in here, right? So time can be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever, right? Time can be all those. You're, you're supposed to put in time like two or three or four or whatever, and it's supposed to make an answer. Note it's not always 24. So you, what you really need to do, because it's in multiple parts, you need to think of it in multiple parts. For, for instance, when
time is less than four, it's clearly always a six, right? So when time is less than four, it's always a six, but now you integrate time. So it's six T, it's, it's six T. Let's see if that formula works. Over here, when time was three, we said it was 18. Put in a three and put a three in right there. What do you get? 18, right? So what it does is basically the integral under the curve, you integrate from here to here. That means you're constantly picking up, picking up values at the rate of six. So it's at time equal three, it's 18. At time equal four, it's 24. Now, when time is greater than four, see, when time was less than four, it was really a one-part formula. But when time is greater than four, it's a two-part formula. And when it's greater than, you have to do it this way. You do the first part and the second part, which is 24. So after time equal four, it does level off at 24. You don't pick up or lose any more information. And so you get this. If that is your function, that is its interval. Um, this needs a little four on there right there. I don't know why I don't have it. Okay. So these kinds of problems, and there's more subtle ones and things will come upon, but uh, these kinds of problems like um, 4.7, for instance, I didn't assign that one. I think I find 4.8, it'll be easy. 4.7 is the, in the book is the kind that really make a difference here, I think. Let's go over to the problems. Okay. There was problem 4.5 that we just worked, okay? There was that one. Um, you're assigned, I think, for something like 4.8. But this one here, for practice, you should work this one particularly this part B, 